Hello, Foam Crusaders, and welcome to our latest episode. My name is Sean Wasser Krug, and we have ourselves today another review roundup where I'm going to be reviewing four movies that I have just seen recently that's come out in the last uh, month. Uh, on today's episode, we're going to be talking about the latest film to hit theaters, Madam Web. Uh, we're also going to be talking about Lisa Frankenstein, a straight to streaming movie, uh, No Way Up, and Miller's Girl. Uh, first things first, we're going to start with Madam Web. Uh, Madam Web. Uh, where to start with Madam Web? Um, I have not been a huge fan of the Sony Spider Verse outside of the animated Spider Verse, which is fantastic. Um, obviously we got the Tobey Maguire Spider Man films, which I've actually, you know, loved the first two films. The third one, I think everyone is kind of in agreement. You either love it or you love to hate it. Uh, of course, you got the Andrew Garfield uh, Amazing Spider-Man um, two films, which I actually liked both, but they were more worried about creating what's going on now, which is a a Spider Verse of spinoff films, than actually focusing on Andrew Garfield's Peter Parker, which the MCU did a way better version of that in No Way Home than they did with two films that Sony did. But you know, we have these 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 new Spider-Man spinoff films with the Venoms, which I've never been a fan of the Tom Hardy Venom movies. I love Venom as a character and Carnage as a character, but I have really disliked how Sony has handled the Venom franchise, even though I know we're getting a third film of that. Uh, and then Morbius is freaking Morbius. But with Madam Web, <clears throat> even right out of the gate with the first trailer, this was a movie that I couldn't really figure out what it wanted to be. I couldn't decide whether it wanted to be a Final Destination Spider-Man type film, which on paper, that sounds actually very intriguing. Uh, but with the cast and just what they showed us right off the bat to try to sell us on this movie, it was not doing a good job to make me feel good about wanting to see it. Of course, word of mouth was spreading about how bad this film was, which, for the most part, doesn't deter me from wanting to see a movie or not. It might deter me from paying to go see it in theaters and waiting for it to hit, you know, for it to hit streaming. Um, but because it is a Spider-Man film or a Spider-Man franchise because uh, spider-man is not in this movie technically at all uh but nonetheless i went out to check out madam webb the main general plot of madam webb is cassandra webb is a new york uh paramedic who begins to demonstrate signs of clairvoyance forced to challenge revel rel revelations about her past she needs to safeguard three young women from a deadly adversary who wants them destroyed uh we're starring uh, dakota johnson who I'm kind of wish-washy on. There's things I like her in, like Peter Butter Falcon, and even stuff during her TV show days. But lately, every time I see Dakota Johnson, she just looks disinterested in her films. Um, like, she's just kind of going through the motions, like she doesn't really want to be there. And that, frankly, does not change here in Madam Web. She just seems like, and she's even said this in interviews going into the press screens of this, is that this is not the movie she signed up for. I don't know what movie she did sign up for, but nonetheless, when you already have the star of your film not really speaking positively about the film that they're in as it's being released, it doesn't really bode well for the actual you know quality of the film itself. But Dakota Johnson, I know she's capable of good performances because I've seen good performances come out of her. This is not one of those films. She see, feels like she's sleepwalking through this. She's giving bland delivery after bland delivery. There are moments in the film where I feel like she does try, but they come and go so fast that you're just more perplexed by her performance and wondering, is she just doing this for a paycheck or does she really just not give a damn through her performance of the film? Uh, your other leads in the film, you've got uh, Sydney Sweeney, who I have said on numerous occasions, I don't understand the the huge you know stuff about her because everything that I've seen Sydney. Now, granted, I've never seen Utopia, which I hear she's good in that, but in terms of movies, um, I have not been impressed by Sydney Sweeney one bit, and. She does not impress me in this film either. I will say in terms of her performance, this is not a bad performance by Sydney Sweeney in the film, but it's definitely not something that makes her stand out either. Um, Celeste O'Connor uh, plays Maddie Franklin. Uh, oh, Sydney Sweeney plays Julia Cornwall. Uh, but Celeste O'Connor plays Maddie Franklin. I 
for the most part, liked her performance. Um, she kind of plays the badass of the group. Um, and then we also have Isabella Merced, who I've actually enjoyed for most of her movie career. I, every time I see her in something, I've actually really enjoyed her performances. And I'm excited to see what she does uh, playing Dina in Last of Us Season 2 when that comes out. Uh, she plays Anya uh, Corazon. Um, she kind of plays more of the brains of the group. Um, and I actually you know, didn't mind her performance what either uh, but the problem is with them is they're basically it's like you're reading the script of what your character is supposed to be and they give you character plots oh she's nerdy she's the rebel she's the smart one and they basically play those pretty much to a t but they aren't really given that much time to really develop these characters to really make you care about these characters outside of these are the main characters that Cassandra Webb is trying to save and we get literally maybe 45 seconds to an actual minute of them in Spider-Man uniform for anyone who saw the trailers for this film if you're expecting to see them become these badass spider women that we see in the trailers you only get about 45 seconds of that most of it is in the trailer that you saw um so if that's what you're going for, you're already going to be upset. Um, but <clears throat> these three ladies, they are basically given plot devices to play through throughout the film. Confused, scared, rebellious, stupid, because they're teenagers, and then fear. Until they eventually learn to accept their fate and fight back to a point. But not even that, they don't do that well. Um... Uh, it's all very bare bones and bare basic uh, for them, and they're not given enough. Could they have done more with these roles? Absolutely. But the plot and the script of this film does not care about wanting to elevate these characters past the base points of what the script tells them they are. Same thing with Cassandra Webb as Dakota Johnson. She's basically there to kind of just be this plot device to move the plot forward through the film, she gives she's given moments to try to elevate her character or to try to develop her character a little bit more but once again dakota johnson just feels like she's sleepwalking through this film literally near the end of the second act going to the third act they decide to do an exposition dump and totally completely move her away from everyone to go on a little side mission which granted did develop the story a little bit but it was a little too little too late at that point in the film that it just really kind of stops the movie to basically go, oh, here's plot points that we probably should have given you in the first 45 minutes of the film, but we're giving it to you now well over an hour into the movie, when we really should be developing these girls and their relationship with Cassandra Webb to the point when we get to the inevitable end of the film, Dakota Johnson's character is not even acting like she was in the first half. It's almost like she had uh, a, like a mind wipe and has completely just changed her whole character structure of how her, you know, she speaks, her mindset, her way of thinking, and and has developed this relationship with these girls that maybe she has spent a combined few hours with, maybe a day tops, and has now like developed this bond, which once again, it's told, not shown. We're not given that time to really develop a relationship with these girls outside of who are you, why are you doing this, why are you trying to save us, oh my god, please save us, we believe you. That's basically what we're getting throughout this film. You also have uh, Tahar Rahim, who plays Ezekiel Sims. He's the villain of the film, which basically the best way to describe him is someone who's wearing Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man suit inside out, who has all the abilities of Spider-Man minus the webbing, with zero charisma, zero character arc, and outside of, once again, a basic level of what the plot tells us his character is supposed to be, that is all we have to go on. Could they have given him more time? Absolutely. Could they have made us actually care about his character or build up to his character for why he cares so much about XYZ towards these girls outside of the bare plot? Uh, we could have gotten more out of him. He's not given much to do, therefore he doesn't really... I, I know this guy's capable of good acting as well, and that's, that's the main problem with this film is I know this cast is capable of good acting. Uh, I like most of the people in this film. Adam Scott plays Ben Parker. Emma Roberts plays Mary Parker. Uh, these are all characters or actors that I enjoy, but the plot and the script is so bland and cringeworthy. Some of the dialogue is so cringeworthy that you just don't care at the end of the day. When we do get some action sequences, they're so jolted and jagged and quick jump sh uh, you know, shots that you can't even really 
comprehend what's actually happening because I don't know if it's because of just bad special effects or because it didn't cut right, but it you can't even enjoy the action moments that we actually do get, and it's all rushed to an inevitable ending, which the third act finale does kind of look good, but once again, compared to what we've gotten in previous Spider-Man films or even previous spin-off Spider-Man films such as Venom and Morbius, this is not that good. It's not even remotely close to those other ones, and that's saying a lot because I really disliked Morbius. Um, at the end of the day, with, with, with Madam Web, this is a failed attempt. This is something that could have been something, but even when the first shows came out, you could tell that there was no love put into this film. There was no effort put into this film. This feels like a Spider-Man spinoff cash grab that Sony's been trying to do and has been failing to do outside of Venom um, since uh, the Amazing Spider-Man films came out. Uh, this is one of the worst films of the year so far, and it's it's frustrating because this has a cast that is capable of so much more, but it's handled so poorly, so lazily throughout this movie with the script and just everything about it that I can't even recommend to check this movie out. There's no point to check this movie out, um, and even when they do try to connect it to Spider-Man, it's eye-rolling uh, annoying. Uh, to a point, um, you know, there's, I'm not even gonna say it because in terms of spoilers, people who actually do care enough to want to see this movie, it's just, like, it, it's, it's almost as bad as the Michael Keaton post credit scene in Morbius, is that they're forcing Spider-Man stuff in there, so that way you have a reason to say this is a Spider-Man franchise film, but literally, you could remove the Spider-Man aspects from this film, and this movie would still be the same film, uh, because there's nothing about this movie that connects itself to Spider-Man outside of force stuff that puts it in. Madam Web is is a complete disappointment. <laughs> it is unwatchable to a point outside of just wanting to watch these actresses be on screen for an hour and 45 minutes, whether it's good or bad. There's nothing redeeming about this film. Um, but I still like the, the you, know, perf you know, not the performances, but I still like this cast. I just don't like anything that they're doing in this film but it's not their fault it is the direction the script and everything about them but not them directly so for me i'm going to give madam webb a 20 percent uh my lowest score of the year so far which is really sad to say but yeah madam webb i would not recommend do not go out of your way to see that movie um going into our next film it is lisa frankenstein this came out a couple weeks back um, written by Diablo Cody, directed by Zelda Williams, uh, daughter of Robin Williams. This is her first directorial debut. Uh, stars Catherine Newton and um, uh, Cole Sprouse. Uh, many people will know Cole from Riverdale or Big Daddy or even Friends to a point when they were younger or uh, was it Zach and Cody. <laughs> your, main, your main plot for Lisa Frankenstein is... Uh, Coming, uh, it, it's a coming-of-rage love story about a teenager and her crush who happens to be a corpse. After a set of horrific circumstances bringing him back to life, the two embarked on a journey to find love, happiness, and a few missing body parts. The main selling factor of this film, and I think that's also been the main publicity for this film and marketing, is Diablo Cody. Many people love Diablo, Co Diablo Cody's writing. You know, She did Juno and Jennifer's Body. But, I mean, looking at her writing since then she really hasn't done much and what she has done has not been anything really to write home about it hasn't been anything that has really made diablo cody diablo cody uh and even then juno was really good i personally never saw jennifer's body um so diablo cody wasn't really a selling point for me what was a selling point for me was Catherine newton who i enjoy i've been watching her since she popped up on supernatural i really enjoyed her in freaky uh, a couple years back with vince vaughn and cole sprouse is a young actor who i think has been kind of typecast to a point because of Riverdale and stuff, but I really wanted to see him break out more. And when seeing trailers for this film, I wasn't necessarily loving how they were marketing the film because you couldn't figure out what the tone really wanted to be. But it honestly reminded me of a film from the uh, early 90s called My Boyfriend's Back, which it's so bad it's cheesy good kind of film from the early 90s. So I was going in with that kind of mindset to maybe like it that way, and it does have that kind of mindset with it which probably is what made me enjoy it to a point i think Catherine newton is playing this character of um of lisa very well she's playing it kind of all over the place but that is what the script is calling for uh i also think um lisa sorbereno 
Uh, she plays Taffy, who's Lisa's um, sister or half sister. Uh, I've never seen her in anything, but I actually really enjoyed her performance in the film. She brings this kind of bubbly personality. She looks like she could be the mean girl cheerleader sister, but she actually plays it with this kind of um, softness and, and care for the Lisa character that you weren't really expecting because of how that character normally is in most films. I actually really liked her performance in this. Uh, Cole Sprouse, he's good in the movie for what he's doing. I kind of wish they would have given him a little more to do because he doesn't really get, outside I think of, of the last scene of the movie, he doesn't get any speaking lines and I was kind of <laughs> hoping he was going to have some speaking lines in the film. But physicality wise, I think Cole Sprouse does a solid job in the movie. Uh, Carla Gugino, or Gugino, who I love in everything, um, did not love her performance in this. It's one of the few films I did not love her performance in. She basically is playing kind of the evil stepmother uh, role in this movie. Um, she's definitely playing a type role. It's not that she's bad in it. It's just an unlikable character, which she's doing her job in that role. You're not supposed to like her character in this. Um, but it was just a role that was not something I really cared to watch. Um, with Lisa Frankenstein, though, uh, the style is there, whether you're on board with it or not. I couldn't tell whether it wanted to be a, you know, 80s music video or Edward Scissorhands. And it kind of felt a mix between the two, but the problem with Lisa Frankenstein for me is as much as I wanted to like this movie, I wanted to enjoy it. I wanted to come go out of my way and say, this is actually really good, you guys should give it a chance. There's so many plot threads that are either started or starting to develop in the film that you're like, this could be interesting, I want to see where this goes, and it goes nowhere. There's this very important character plot point for the Lisa character that they explain right from the get-go. And it's like, wow, that's a really unique character point. I wonder where that's going to go in the, in the movie. And it goes nowhere. And at that point, it's like, why did you make this a character plot? for for the Lisa character if you were never really going to go back to it. Um, at that point, you're just doing it to do it, but it's such a unique character plot that to never go back to it just seems what was the point outside of just having something weird and kooky. Um, I will say this. Uh, I got to find um, his, his name. Uh, Joel Crest plays Dale, uh, Lisa's father. Many people will know him as the father uh, from Stranger Things. This guy has officially basically been typecast as the dad who never knows what the fuck's going on and who's just sitting at the dinner table uh, reading the newspaper. Um, I immediately saw him and immediately went, Stranger Things, Dad. And he does get to talk more in this than he does in Stranger Things, but this dude is going to be this kind of character probably for the rest of his life now. Um, but yeah, at, at the with, with Lisa Frankenstein, there was things that you wanted – to like about it, like I said, the performances, I, th I think Catherine Newton is chewing up the scenery in this in a good way, sometimes a little overacting, but I enjoyed it because I like her as a performer, and I actually had fun watching her, and like I said, Lisa Soberano as Taffy, I enjoyed her for what she was in the film, but there's just the script, there was so many things that they could have gone for, they could have gone a little bit further here, or they could have got a little more riskier with certain things, and they do to a point, but then it just doesn't amount to anything. Uh, by the end of the film, that it was just like, it felt like they were, it felt like they were building up for something, almost like you're doing a, a big presentation for a class project, but they ran out of time, and so they just rushed to the end, and was like, oh, the end, and that's what Lisa Frankenstein just felt like, because I felt like they, it needed another 15, 20 minutes to really flesh out the story, and to allow these characters to do more, because it really was, just felt rushed by the time we actually really got into the thick of the story with this. That just kind of made me feel like I, di I didn't get the full picture from this movie. So, like I said, there are things to like about Lisa Frankenstein, and I really, really wanted to enjoy it. But by the end of the film, I just felt like there was a huge thread, mul multiple threads actually, missing from this film compared to you know, a main plot point of the Lisa character to just how the movie ended by the end of the film, and it also has a weird ending, which you can kind of chalk up as something that's actually happening, or maybe in their mind, we don't know, um, but yeah, Lisa Frankenstein, almost there, but it was a miss for me, I'm gonna give it a 50%, uh, going to the next film is No Way Up, now, normally these straight-to-streaming films, I 
wouldn't even bat an eye at. I wouldn't watch. I wouldn't care to watch. But the trailer popped up for me here, and the premise of this film was intriguing enough for me to want to check this movie out. I went in with very low expectations, because usually these movies aren't good. Uh, and the main plot for No Way Up is characters from different backgrounds are thrown together when the plane they're traveling on crashes into the Pacific Ocean. A nightmare fight for survival ensues when the air supplies running out and dangers creeping in from all sides. AKA, there's a hole in the side of the plane, they're in an air pocket, and sharks are coming in to try to attack, basically eat the, you know, the dead of the plane. Um, the, the plot point of this, it's done by the people who did 47 meters down. Um, so we know these people know how to do shark movies, um, whether they, but they don't have usually a great cast around them. So that's always like the thing is that the people for 47 meters down, good shark action, not so good in terms of the cast, but in terms of the suspense and the scares and just that claustrophobicness, they are masters at. And No Way Up does exactly that. Uh, the only real big name that I knew going into this was, was Cole Meany, which... For me, I mean, I, he usually plays just kind of a jackass through most films. Like, if anyone has seen Con Air, you guys know who Cole Meany is. He's in a bunch of other things as well. Uh, but I, th what, I, what I'm surprised about with, with No Way Up is that, yes, it is a relatively no-name cast, but I felt like they utilized it very well throughout. I think they, they utilized the, the plot. I think they utilized the, the structure of the movie with, like I said, a plane crashes into the Pacific Ocean, they're in an air pocket, they're barely confined, basically to about 20 feet of space, while they're honestly being attacked and hunted by sharks, while they're waiting to be rescued or having to find a way out themselves. Um, the main character in the film is uh, Ava, played by Sophie McIntosh. Uh, I, I don't recall seeing her in anything that I've noticed before, but I actually thought she was solid in the film. Um... Like I said, Cole Meany as Brandon, he's kind of her bodyguard because Ava is the daughter of the governor. Um, he's actually pretty good in, in the moments that we do get him in because he's not in the movie a whole lot, but what we do get of him, he's actually very good in. Uh, there's a uh, grandmother, uh, granddaughter characters of uh, Phyllis Logan who plays Marty and Grace Nettle who plays Rosa. I thought they were actually pretty solid in the film. These aren't going to be performances that you're going to remember you know, two, three months from now, maybe even three weeks from now. But I felt like this was a movie that utilized its characters effectively, utilized the plot, utilized the scares, the, the, the claustrophobicness of the situation, and the suspense, that by the end of the movie, it was actually a pretty solid film. I didn't feel like I wasted 90 minutes watching this movie. I felt like it was a solid 90-minute adventure that we went on with these characters, and it utilized everything that it needed to utilize to its efficiency. Like I said, it's not something that you're going to remember a long time from now, but for at the moment, this is one of those straight to streaming films that I was actually happy to check out. And it's something that I would recommend people to check out if you guys can see it. If you're into these kinds of movies, if you're not into these kinds of movies, you're not going to think anything of it. But if you're a fan of the 47 Meters Down films or anything like that, I think No Way Up is a solid watch. Um, it's not going to be on a, any best of lists, but it might be on most surprising by the, at least a half year mark because I went with relatively zero expectations. And at the end of the day, I enjoyed this throughout. So I shouldn't give No Way Up a 71%. Uh, going to our final film uh, is Miller's Girl. Um, this was one of those uh, late July films that came out starring Martin Freeman and Jenna Ortega, two uh, performers that I really enjoy in multiple things. Um, the main plot for Miller's Girl is a creative writing assignment yields complex results between a teacher and his talented student. This isn't a story that we haven't seen before. Uh, we've seen this many, many times. You know, you got the the very smart, you know, good-looking, you know, teacher, professor, whatever, you, whatever have you, and then we got the young pupil who is really attaching, and they develop a connection, and stuff happens. Um, you got Martin Freeman, who plays Jonathan Miller. You got Jenna Ortega, who plays Cairo Sweet. Uh, and that's basically what this film is. It's, it's all about the seduction and kind of foreplay between these two characters. Um, you've got, in terms of the cast, there's really only three other, you know, members, really, of the, of the cast that's of importance. You got 
uh, Bashir Salahuddin. I probably said that wrong, and I apologize. He plays Boris Fillmore, which is the, one of the teachers who's a friend of Jonathan Miller. I actually really liked his performance. I feel like every time he came on screen, him and Martin Freeman had really good chemistry together as friends, and they were a lot of fun watching them interact with one another. Uh, Gideon Adelon plays Winnie, which is uh, Cairo's friend. Her first few scenes are very cringy, but then you kind of get used to how her character is and how she acts. And by the end of the movie, I actually was really enjoying her performance overall. And I felt like her scenes with uh, Jenna Ortega were some of the strongest in the movie. And then you got uh, Dagmara Damajek. Damajek? I apologize. Uh, she plays uh, B or Beatrice, which is Jonathan's uh, wife in the film. Her scenes are usually very um, forced, very uh, graphic of a sexual nature towards Jonathan. She's this kind of a berated wife who kind of talks down to him, kind of belittles him because he was a writer who has now become a teacher because his writing didn't go the way he hoped. So she, she thinks she's above him throughout the film. And so when Martin or when Martin Freeman's character is has this this student in Cairo played by Ortega, and she's fascinated by him and he's fascinated by her writing you get this development between those two where it's basically literary porn where these two basically are talking to each other with so much of a vocabulary that you feel like you need a a thesaurus to figure out what they're saying most of the time but it's basically them having vocabulary foreplay with one another while they're basically trying to undress each other with their eyes now for these two characters you got martin freeman good looking dude jenna ortega beautiful woman um, so the scenes that they're in are, you know, intriguing and enjoyable. It's the sexiest probably both of these two have ever been in any film they've done so far. Uh, and there are some good moments in this movie. There's one particular scene in this film where Jenna Ortega and Martin Freeman really kind of go into each other. It's, it's an argument about near the end of the second half of the movie. And I think both of them actually kill this scene. I think they both get their moment to kind of, it's kind of a, you know, an, uh, a match game between these two you know martin character uh, jonathan comes at jenna ortega and then she comes at him and it's this verbal bashing of one another and i think that scene is incredibly well done and really well acted and outside of these these scenes of just seduction and foreplay there's not really a whole lot more to the film besides that there's there's this underlining story that we've got between these two characters of oh did they do something or is this all in their heads or did something really happen is there something we that we didn't get to see on screen what's going to happen with these characters and then we start just as the movie starts to get interesting the movie ends and it just kind of felt like this movie was exactly what we had been watching for the past 90 minutes which was a giant tease we've been watching these two characters and jonathan miller and cairo sweet basically dance around each other with foreplay of words and by the time we actually get to an inevitable point when everything comes to a head the movie stops now yes we do see kind of what drives both these characters to this point but when we never get to this point where we're about to hit an impasse between their characters the movie just abruptly ends which basically made me feel cheated um so while i enjoyed all five performances in this movie, I thought Freeman, Ortega, Adelon, um, Bashir, and Dagmara are all really good in this movie. The script is a little rough at points. It, it, it goes out of its way to be crass and R-rating and go real sexual with its terms, which I don't care about that. But it's just one of those things where there's certain words that certain actors say, was like, wow, I never thought I'd ever hear Martin Freeman say that word. I never thought I'd hear Jordan Ortega say that word. Um, doesn't make it bad or anything. It just means it's like it kind of it's it's almost like when a teenager is writing a sto- a story and they want to act adult, so they start throwing all these you know big sexual words in. But do they do they hold the weight? Do they have we built up enough a character between these for these words to really sink in or matter, or is it just a, a you know a young person trying to throw a bunch of words in to you know feel adult and feel sexy and and crass and everything and well, like I said, I enjoy the performance of everyone. It's it's the dialogue that doesn't quite fit in certain parts. When it works, it works. When it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But at the, but at the end of the day with this movie, it just, once again, felt like a giant tease. Because once, once we actually were starting to get to a, a breaking point and really started to get interesting, it just abruptly ends. So for me, like I said, 
there are things I liked about it. I enjoy the performances, but the story ultimately cuts off right when it starts to get good. Uh, so for me, I'm going to give Miller's Girl a 55%. Um, that's it for the reviews of this episode. Like I said, I wish I was giving you a lot more positives out of this episode, but these were more movies that were just, had potential, but ultimately just did not hit the mark on almost any of them, except for No Way Up, shockingly, because that one, um, just <laughs> surprised the heck out of me, just because I expected it to suck. Uh, but I hope you guys enjoyed this review. If you guys did, go hit that like, share, and subscribe button to the channel so you guys stay up to date with all the latest videos pop up on the Movie Crusaders. Of course, you can follow us on all the social media outs you see below. Uh, coming up next, um, I think the only movie that comes out this week is, uh, Drive Away Dolls. Um, I don't know if it's going to be available in my area, so I don't know if I'll be watching that here, uh, this soon, or if I'll probably just have to wait for that to pop up on streaming, and then I can watch it, and if it's worth a review, we'll pop it up here on the channel. Um, I'm sure Brian and I will be coming back on here at some point to do our Movie Crusaders chat about. Myself and Jordan will be back here next week, uh, for Wrestling Crusaders, for the aftermath of Elimination Chamber, which airs this weekend, as well as continuing our Road to WrestleMania discussion on that, so if you're a fan of wrestling... Check out Wrestling Crusaders for Jordan and I on that. Uh, but until next time, in case I don't see you, go watch some movies and go have some fun. You're still here. It's over. Go home.